Um, all right, so with that, uh, we're going to launch into the first session, which is uh, employment law updates. Steve Goldberg and I are going to be uh, uh, splitting that. You should have a handout in front of you, which has all of the PowerPoint presentations in order that you're going to hear today, uh, with even some note lines. So you, you know, can take notes and put things out your fridge or whatever you want to do. Uh, yes, that's a question. All right, here we go. Employment law update. We're going to start off with uh, at-will employment. Some of these things you may know, and what you're going to hear from us probably is we could probably spend about an hour on any one of these slides all day today, but we're going to be going you know, very, 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 very fast and load you up with information. Oh yeah, before we get started, this is the first slide. I just want to set the tone for, for, for being a little scared today of what you're going to hear. So what we often hear from all of you is, you know, you can't do anything anymore, right? Every time you turn around, the employees are making claims and suing you and whatever. What the heck does that mean? So this is an actual case I just wanted to share with you. Kevin Burling, an employee, worked for Gravity Diagnostics in Covington, Kentucky. His supervisor came to Kevin and said, Hey Kevin, your birthday's next week. We're going to have a little party for you. And Kevin said, please don't. I have anxiety disorder. Do not have a party for me. The manager either forgot or said, I don't care. And not only did he have a party for Kevin, they had a surprise party. For Kevin. Kevin walked into a surprise party, had an anxiety attack, had to leave the company. The managers called it, called it in two days later to apologize. He had an anxiety attack at that meeting with the managers. Then four days later, they fired him because they said he was a threat to the other employees. Guess what? Kevin sued the company, right? The case did not settle, went to trial, and the jury awarded him $150,000 in back pay and $300,000 in pain and suffering. Kevin got four hundred and fifty thousand dollars because they threw him a surprise party. Um, but, but the point of the story for everyone here, right? Most people here are HR and you deal with HR issues. Is he said he disclosed he had an anxiety disorder and that's a disability under the ADA. So regardless of how it came up, it was an ADA disability suit. So. Just wanted to kind of set the mood for, 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 for what we're talking about for the rest of the, the, rest of the day. Okay. At will employment. At will employment. So some of the, some of those people may not be entirely familiar. We always start with at will employment because it's so basic. The employer or the employee may terminate the employment relationship. Most people are at will. It means that you don't have a contract, right? You don't have a contract that says when you can be fired or you don't have a union contract. You can be fired for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all. You don't need a good reason to let employees go. It would be nice if you had a good reason and if you documented it, but you don't need any really any reason. So most employees, many employees don't really know that. They think they think you need a, you know, a very good reason. Remember, I hear this a lot, and we all hear this a lot. Oh, I know, I know we can't fire an employee because Pennsylvania is a right to work state. Don't say right to work state. It has nothing to do with that well employment. Right to work has to do with whether you have know, a union shop and whether you can still work even though you're a member of a collective bargaining agreement or whatever. So right to work has nothing to do with that will. At will is at will and it's time to you know we won't be embarrassed in front of your HR friend. You know, don't don't say don't say right to work. That's all you need to know about at will, just a little reminder. Okay, updates. COVID. Remember when there used to be COVID? We used to talk about that. Uh, COVID's not completely over. It's not completely done. But here's kind of the, the latest. Um, one thing I will say, and I'm sure we're all going to say it a little bit, many of these slides are text heavy. There's lots of words on the slides, and we're not going to read every word of every slide. That's why you have the handout. Um, so we'll make a few points, and if you're interested in it, then you can you can look at it later. So I just want to let you know we're skipping a lot. You can't read that fast, right? Which we know. <laughs> um, so COVID-related developments continue to impact employment. COVID is still out there, at least in the questions that we get. Certainly in the lawsuits that we're seeing, you must be aware of the legal developments and the regulations because. 
employees are still asking about, about COVID. This is one of the slides, we're not going to read every word. Um, but this is a little history of the CDC. Back in August, the CDC issued guidance observing increasing levels of vaccination. Essentially, the CDC has said, we're not going to be defining people by vaccination status anymore. That's not what we're, we're going to be doing. If you want to test, you can test, but test everyone. And you, you don't have to, you're not going to make a distinction based on if people uh, have, have a vaccination or, or not. And they also have uh, uh, renewed guidance on quarantining, how long you should be out, how long you should wear a mask, those, those sorts of things. So if you haven't seen the CDC guidelines lately, then there you go. Some companies don't follow CDC guidelines, right? They're guidelines. And some companies say, well, to be safe, we're going to follow the CDC because we can't really be criticized if we do that. Some companies say, I don't care what the CDC says, you know, we're going to do whatever, whatever we do, whatever we want. Um, but look at the latest CDC guidelines about quarantining and, and exposure. The, the, the periods are, have shortened up, certainly, about when they recommend people can come back to work. Um, uh, this has to do with testing, the CDC testing. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to tell you is, uh, let's see, where are we here? Yes. Um, those who are symptomatic or have tested positive are supposed to isolate for five days or 24 hours after they experience symptoms, which is longer, and then wear a mask for 10 full days. This is the, this is the part that people ask the most questions about. What do you do if someone's tested positive? or if they have symptoms. So again, you know, this is on this slide uh, to, to, to take a look at. Where this is going is uh, the EEOC has issued guidelines that have basically have said COVID can be a disability. It can be an ADA disability. It's not always an ADA disability, but it can be. And it depends on what the person has. If the person has long COVID or has extended periods of time where they can't breathe, as an example, that could be considered a disability. So the lesson there is you cannot assume that COVID is a disability, or you shouldn't assume, and you can't assume that it's not. You can't say, oh, COVID, no, that has ADA has nothing to do with that. You can't, you can't assume that. You really have to dig into what the person had and how it's coming up in the context for you. This, uh, this talks about the update on the ETS on the, uh, the emergency temporary standard. It was, it was issued, that was stalled, and now it's still stalled. So I know a lot of us in this room, we're getting all geared up, oh no, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna go into effect, now what? Now nothing yet, and probably nothing official, you know, going, going forward. Um, if you're in the city of Philadelphia, I'm just curious, how many people from, from Philly work in Philly? We have people. Okay, that's good, that's good to know because there are, there are many slides here in all three presentations where we say, you know, you don't have to do this except if you're in Philly. You know, <laughs> or, you know this doesn't apply to anyone except if you're in Philadelphia. Um, so there's two or three things like that, uh, that like, like, like that at least. So this is what we just said that. Um, that, um, uh, that staying up to date with boosters is key. Again, this is advice from the, from the CDC. So the point is, if you still have COVID issues, people are still asking you, then check out the, the CDC regulations. And this, is a, this is a good summary. What you should know on the legal front, on the litigation front, is that we are seeing lawsuits related to vaccination. Not so much mask wearing, but, but vaccination. So we have... Um, I don't know, four cases, three or four cases in the office, like something like that. Yeah, we have cases in the office right now where an employee said, I was terminated from my job because I didn't get vaccinated and I had a religious exemption, or I, I said I had a religious exemption, but it was denied, or I had a health exemption and it was denied. So we're seeing cases like that come, come through. But there's all sorts of cases. The religious, as we said, disability, like we said, just plain old wrongful discharge, which in Pennsylvania is not a very good claim for employees. You know, we talk about that. Employees are going to, you know, sue us for wrongful discharge. 
parents, that's difficult for employees in the state. Um, privacy violations, if it's a breach of the CBA, of the collective bargaining agreement, the union uh, agreement, and then just common law contracts. Sometimes people have contracts with the employer that they say were breached because they were terminated or not allowed to work or whatever. Um, and then, and then, uh, and then finally, this is what I mentioned that the definition of disability is has been uh, has been updated to include COVID nineteen issues. So again, lots of words in here. I know. Lots of words. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I guess one more. The the remote work again. We could spend an hour talking about remote work, right? And all the joys of trying to figure that out. Uh, people working from home, accountability, how you know how they get paid, how to record hours, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that we just want to point out is remote work is still. I don't think I have to tell you this. Remote work is still a very, very popular topic among employees and employers. People still ask. People are still trying to figure out, figure it out. Uh, but even though you might not have your entire workforce working remotely anymore, don't give it short shrift. You have to think, okay, wait a minute, how, how are we gonna keep hours? Are there tax issues here? Uh, how do people get paid? Are you asking people to work uh, you know, late at night or on the weekends if they're hourly workers and all sorts of things like that? So. Okay, that's COVID. Next topic, abortion rights. The non-political presentation. Uh, I, I wouldn't know where to start on the politics. I mean, um, this is just just the facts. So, um, as I'm, I'm sure all of you know, very aware, uh, the Dobbs case in June uh, 2022, Supreme Court uh, decided. Uh, people say that the Supreme Court outlawed abortion. The Supreme Court did not outlaw abortion. What they said is that there's no federal constitutional right to abortion. Uh, technically, what they said is there's no constitutional right allowing women to terminate a pregnancy prior to the date of viability. That's the actual de definition. Obviously, overturned Roe versus Wade and then a companion case plan, Parenthood uh, versus Casey. And I think we all know that the states now have. Uh, powers back to the states to decide on abortion rights. This is very complicated, I will tell you, the abortion rights issue right at the moment for us, for, for employment lawyers. You have that going on, on on a national stage, certainly, the abortion rights debate. But from, from our perspective, we get questions about, well, can we have a policy that allows a woman to travel to another state to get an abortion if she wants to, who's an employer of our company. Okay, there's nothing, there's nothing preventing a policy like that. But what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that you have to also give it to other people to try, try to make that equal? Does that mean that it's, it's vacation time for that? Is it extra time for that? I mean, there are some issues there when you start changing these policies for one particular group of people. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and back up one step, Title VII, federal Title VII, prevents discrimination based on race, speed, color, national origin, gender, sexual harassment, those sorts of things. An amendment to Title VII is the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. And the PDA protects pregnant women already, including women who may need or may choose to get an abortion. So there already is protection under the PDA for, uh, for abortion rights. Um, the EEOC has taken the position that employers can't discriminate against women uh, on the basis of an abortion. The Family Medical Leave Act already gives employees rights for, for people, men and women, who have a serious health condition. Um, so, and then on top of that, there are some there's some speech issues under the National Labor Relations Act. So, in other words, if you tell people you can't talk about this, these things at work, you always have to worry about the so-called Section Seven rights. The National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, is often thought to be just something that applies to unions. You know, and if you're sitting there thinking, I don't have to worry about the NLRA. Or whenever anyone talks about the NLRB, and eh, whatever, no, nah, not so. It, it does apply to unions, but it also applies to companies that don't have unions, that are not organized. So 
You do have to worry about that, however. Just a little bit. All right. On the state level, 26 states now have laws that in some way restrict abortion care. The laws vary. They're all over the place in terms of the penalties for uh, either, either doctors uh, 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 performing abortion, up, up, to criminal, up to criminal liability. Um, in Pennsylvania, right now, abortion is legal up to 24 weeks uh, for any reason except, except uh, based on the, the sex of the fetus, the gender of the fetus. Travel benefits, this is what we're talking about. Some employers are offering to pay travel benefits. Some are waiting to see what happens with the elections. I just had an email yesterday. I followed up with a client and said, hey, um, I thought we were gonna review your, your travel policy on abortion rights, and she wrote back and she said, we decided to wait until after the election to see what happens. I'm not exactly sure which way that cuts, what that means to them, but... Um, so, so employers are, are weighing the risks and, uh, risks and the benefits. Be careful under IRS rules, travel might be considered a benefit, it might be considered compensation to someone. So they may have to pay tax on the benefit that they get from the, from the, from the travel. Um, FMLA will likely cover the travel if you, do, if you do afford travel benefits for that. Uh, Title VII requires similar treatment for everyone. The Title VII requires similar mm -hmm. treatment for women who are pregnant who uh, have nothing, who don't choose an abortion, or those who do. That's, that's, that's been the same. And of course, you always have to ask whether state and local leave laws have anything to do with this. Pennsylvania is not great. Again, I'm not telling you anything you already know. Pennsylvania does not have a state leave law, right? They don't have a, there's no such thing as a Pennsylvania Family Leave Act. Um, but there is in Jersey, and there is in, you know, many, many other states. Uh, let's see, here we go. Here we go. There's an executive order, as, as you may know, from President Biden to protect reproductive rights. Um, the EEOC has weighed in about, about uh, emergency medical treatment. The Department of Justice has weighed in uh, about, about the, uh, women traveling for reproductive <coughs> rights. The point on that is, if you have a question or have an issue on uh, abortion rights, you really need to research it. Again, very confusing right now. Lots of competing issues. Forget about abortion rights. There's a lot of competing issues just with any employee leave, right? When it, whenever someone says, I, you know, I want time off when they have a situation, you have the ADA, you have the FMLA, you have maybe workers' comp, you have maybe short-term disability, you have your own policies in your handbook. Um, it can be, you know, it can be challenging. Okay, civil rights. I told you we're going fast. Get the move. Civil rights. First thing is the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. Sometimes you see the acronym up, up, up here. Um, uh, uh, Justice um, Ketanji Brown Jackson uh, sworn in, replaced Breyer. So that's what the court looks like at this point. From the employer's point of view, if the good news is that she has some employer-friendly uh, cases in her in her past, doesn't mean you know she's going to rule in particular way on the Supreme Court. But from the employer view, that's a, that's good. Labor relations for unions likely to be sympathetic to union members. Certainly, certainly Democratic administrations are are more um, are more are more positive towards the employees than um, the Republican administration. All right, caregiver discrimination. This is sort of the next level here. You know you can't discriminate based on gender, of course. Caregiver discrimination is just what it sounds like. Uh, the EEOC, back in March, has said there can be discrimination against people who are considered caregivers. That can be a caregiver for an older person in the home. It can be a caregiver for someone who's disabled. It can be a caregiver for uh, for a child, and it can also be based on the employee's association with a disabled individual. So you don't even have to be the actual caregiver. You might just have someone in your household that's disabled or older, and if the employer discriminates against the employee because they assume there's going to be caregiver responsibilities, that person would be covered under, under Title VII. 
So this is very much gender-based. Caregiver uh, discrimination is very much against women generally because that old cliche, I'm not gonna hire her. She's got two kids under 10. She's gonna be leaving at three o'clock every day for soccer practice and picking up her kids and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, that's a form of caregiver discrimination. It's also what we sometimes call FRD, family responsibilities discrimination. That's what I just described. Sometimes you get that. Sometimes you get that with men. We see it with men when you have single parents. So if you have a single dad and has two kids or a few kids, you see the same sort of bias or the same sort of concern. Um, interestingly though, caregivers do not have a right for a reasonable accommodation. So this is where we start to mix and match the statutes and starts to drive you crazy. Right? The ADA requires a reasonable accommodation. But if somebody walks in and says, I'm a caregiver, I have two kids at home, or I have a, I'm taking care of my elderly parent, or I have a disabled sibling, or something like that, I need an accommodation. You really have to drill down and figure out what is happening here. Um, is this an ADA situation? You know, does the person have a disability? Okay, maybe we're talking about an accommodation. Uh, if someone just says, I have two kids at home and I have a tough schedule, I need an accommodation, you can provide an accommodation, but you're not required to. So once again, it's not a blanket, one size fits all. It depend, really depends exactly on the facts of um, what you have, you have happening. Okay, the Crown Act. Have we the Crown Act? Okay, a few people. <clears throat> The Crown Act, right? They went, they went a long way to figure out this acronym. You know? <laughs> it's about hair. It's about your hairstyle. Um, and the Crown Act, creating and respecting an open world for natural hair. Um, so back in March, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Crown Act. It was not law. It did not pass. It didn't, it didn't pass the Senate. Um, doubtful that it will. I mean, this is my guess. That, that it won't anytime soon. But some states have passed this. You, you, would, need, you would need Senate Republicans to vote for it to avoid the filibuster. Um, and it would be part of Title VII. This goes to national origin discrimination. That's how it started. Employers were making certain decisions or saying or creating a hostile work environment for employees uh, based on their hairstyle. It doesn't have to be African American, but that's kind of how it started. Um, and then spread to other other cultural groups, and obviously any of these statutes apply to everyone. Footnote here: This is something that bugs me. I hear people say all the time, "I need to fire Tom," and I'm not worried about Tom because Tom's not in any protected class. I don't know Tom, but I can tell you that Tom's in a protected class because I know what, I know what they mean. I know what they mean. Tom's a you know 25 year old white male. Uh, you know, okay, so you're so we're safe, which yeah. maybe you're more safe. But everyone's in a protected class, right? So protected class means gender, it means color of your skin, it means national origin, it means religion, it could mean age, um, a variety of other things, disability. So everyone is in multiple protected classes. Just want to get that out. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, sorry, so back to the Crown Act. So, 18 states so far have enacted a Crown Act of similar legislation. Oh, surprise, California was the first uh, state. Anybody have employees in California? Yeah, just, you should just leave now. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, cannot, we cannot help you. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, honestly, we, we, it's almost like we become experts in California because, you know, someone asks us a question and we say, we know the answer, but we need to check California. Um, and actually that spread a little bit. You know, it used to be just California. Now it's, we have to check California, we have to check Illinois, we have to check Massachusetts, you know, we have to check New York. There's other states that, that, are, that are just as um, active. <laughs> Not crazy, Frank. Frank's in crazy hell. They're active. Some might say cutting edge. There's a West Coast. There's a West Coast. Yeah. The West Coast. Um, in Pennsylvania, there, there has been a Crown Act that's been pending for a while. It's now passed in Pennsylvania once again. I personally don't think it's going to pass anytime soon, but it's 
but it's, it's out there. Okay, that's the crown act. This is uh, forced arbitration. Some of you work for companies that have agreements that have arbitration, so that means that if, a, if an employee has a claim that they don't go to court, they go to arbitration. There has been, um, uh, there's a law now, back from March, that says you cannot force employees to arbitrate sexual harassment claims or sexual assault claims, but sexual harassment claims. What's interesting, there are so many laws now about what happens with sexual harassment claims. You, know, you can't have confidentiality in a sexual harassment um, uh, separation agreement or settlement agreement, as an example. But they don't ever talk about the other types of harassment. You know, so, okay, so you can't have arbitration for sexual harassment. Why you can't have it, why you can't have it for gender discrimination or race or for anything else, I don't know. They just kind of focus on sexual harassment. But, but again, if you have an arbitration clause, you're going to need to, uh, you know, you need to uh, take a look at that. Um, yeah. That's you? Yeah. That's you? That's me. All right. I'm going to throw this I'll be back for a couple at the end. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Steve Goldblum. Thank you all for coming. Um, when I told my wife last night I was splitting an hour with my tour, she was like, how much time are you going to have? I said, I don't know. So, so she said the good news is, as only wives can say, you know, they won't have to listen to you for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I like this topic. I like the uh, I like the trending topics because you know one of the most interesting things about what we do is this stuff is changing constantly, as everyone here knows. And you have to constantly review what's new, what's happening, new laws, new regulations, what are the trends. So that's what we're trying to focus on here today is what are the new trends in 2022 and what do we see going forward. Uh, with respect to independent contractors, uh, that's a topic that's going to be covered in more detail later by Michael and Joe. So I'm not going to get into the details of independent contractors. But in terms of what's happening, um, there has been this Department of Labor saga that's been going on for the past several years trying to define what are independent contractors and what are employees. This is a big issue for the government. When they're not getting their tax dollars, they tend to focus on it. And this is one of those things. Um, in 2021, the Trump administration, not surprisingly, issued a more employer-friendly definition of independent contractors, um, essentially talking about an economic reality test. So what is the reality here economically as to the relationship between the, the person and the company to determine if they're independent contractors? In 2021, the Biden administration came in and delayed the implementation of the Trump rule, said let's take a pause here, and ultimately withdrew, the, withdrew that rule. Uh, obviously with the intention of creating a more employer-friendly, I'm sorry, employee-friendly or individual-friendly um, type of definition that would lend to more people being employees as opposed to independent contractors. Um, in March of this year, uh, a Texas court vacated the Biden administration's attempt to delay it, and ultimately they, the Department of Labor has announced that there's going to be a new rule coming out. So the bottom line for independent contractors here is, like many things, it, 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 it ebbs and flows with the administration and uh, how the executive branches are going to look at these things, and they're presently in a state of flux. <clears throat> um, the Department of Labor has really been focusing on this issue. This is a hot issue for the Department of Labor. And just since May of 2022, so just recently, we've been seeing, and what happens is when the EEOC or the Department of Labor or these other agencies settle a case, they publicize it. They want to get the message out there. Um, just since May of 2022, I'm not going to read them all, you know, $230,000 in back pay for misclassification of independent contractors, $166,000, $178,000. You know, so the point being, if you have independent contractors, um, be careful. Talk to us, talk to whomever, make sure they understand whether they're truly classified properly because this is an issue that's really under the microscope and will continue to be. Can I just jump in for one second? Sure. A lot of times this will come to a head because the contractor gets let go, files an unemployment claim, and the company says he or she was not an employee, he or she was an independent contractor. And then it goes down that whole line, and then there's a lawsuit. Because the, work, the unemployment court will say, no, they were an employee. Yeah. And then they sue for back wages, taxes, and so Yeah, and they sue for back wages, and if they didn't keep track of their hours, now you're really an employee. 
Yeah, it, it, it's a problem for sure. No, that's a, that's a good question. And it's, it's a huge issue because look, these are complicated issues, and a lot of clients they just don't understand, you know, exactly what the impact is. I, I, we've had clients that say, "Hey, I have this great idea. I'm going to take all my employees, make them independent contractors. I'll save them in." Yeah, and it's not a it's not a decision of the employer. It's a classification issue. You can't decide this person is an independent contractor or not. So what is the impact? Uh, under the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, employees are entitled to minimum wage and overtime pay and other benefits. Um, you also get workers' compensation and unemployment compensation and protection of civil rights and whistleblower laws, all of these things that don't apply to independent contractors. That's what Michael was saying, is what happens is someone gets let go, they go to say I'd like to get unemployment, they've been misclassified as an independent contractor, they don't get unemployment, they go to see their brother-in-law as a lawyer, and all of a sudden you have a lawsuit on your hands. So that's the, the impact of this misclassification. The Trump administration rule, which is still in effect, made it easier for employers to classify workers as independent contractors. But be careful. Uh, this is another one of those areas that's full of landmines and, it's, and it continues to change. Joint employment, another big trending issue in 2022. Joint employment is the concept that you could have more than one company be an employee's employer. So how does that work if you have, for example, a company that, that has management personnel and places them in a hospital, for example? That hospital might also be deemed a joint employer with the company that placed them there if that person um, is subject to the rules of the hospital or there's control and other issues that are looked at and it's not something that that second company might necessarily be thinking of, that if there was ever a lawsuit, a discrimination suit or something, that they'll be fought, that that would be brought against both the hospital and the company that placed the person. So, you know, in, in a union context, joint employers have a duty to bargain together, both entities are liable for each other's unfair labor practices. And in a non-union context, same thing. If that person was subject to discrimination, both of those entities could be a party to that suit. And I, I know we have a lot of these cases right now in the firm where you're seeing more than one defendant, although the person was technically an employee of only one of them. This is a real trending issue and something to be careful of if it affects your business. Again, another one of these things that's sort of blowing with the political winds in, a, in the Obama era, it had to do with, it was a, a broader definition to get more people covered by joint employment, talked about indirect control. Trump, that administration, narrowed it and said, just if you have direct and immediate control. And now recently, just as recently as September, the National Labor Relations Board has proposed a new test, which is out for comment, which based on the administration would kind of broaden the aspect of, of joint employment again. So once again, if you have these issues, be careful with them, because uh, another one of these things is really full of pitfalls for, for companies. Um, there's a new proposed rule, and it has to do with whether or not the two entities share or co-determine those matters governing at least one of the employee's essential terms and conditions of employment. Shock full of good legal lawyer words there. Um, so, you know, we'll see how this plays out. It's just a proposed rule at this point, and uh, we'll just continue to see where this goes. Pay equity, big one, big issue right now for companies. It's, it's in the media, it's, it's, it's part of the campaign process right now. You're really seeing pay equity issues. On the federal level, the Equal Pay Act, it applies to all private businesses. It doesn't matter your size. It says men and women must be paid the same. You can't discriminate in pay on the basis of the gender of the employee. So what's happening is you're having, that's at a federal level, you're seeing a lot of states and municipalities kind of fill in the blanks here. For example, in New Jersey, in 18, you have the New Jersey Pay Equity Act that broadened that. And it said, unlike the Equal Pay Act that applies to just gender, you can't pay a member of any protected class differently. You can't pay them differently on their sex, their race, their national origin. Um, also, gender discrimination uh, uh, of pay is based on your former job. And, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. What you're seeing there is when companies base your salary of a new employee or your compensation based on what you used to make, it just perpetuates gender inequity. 
if women or people of color have historically been paid less, and you can take into consideration what those people have historically made, it creates a, a, a situation where it perpetuates a salary inequity. And what we're seeing is that that's being addressed on, on different levels, state and local levels. The EEOC is huge on this issue right now. What they're doing is they've, they've required uh, companies to provide information about how they pay their employees. So what you're seeing is in your EEO1s and other um, documentation filed with the federal government, you have to submit pay data. And I'm not going to read this whole slide, but the point being is that the EEOC believes it's fundamental to its purpose to analyze how companies are actually paying employees and using that to target its, uh, its efforts to avoid discrimination. So if it's going to institute some type of investigation, if it's going to look at particular clients, it's going to use their historical pay data to do that. And I was reading through some of this last night, and some of these companies, I mean, the, 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 the inequity was so obvious, paying women significantly lower, paying people of color significantly lower, that these are issues that are really, really hot buttons for the EEOC, and we're going to continue to see these develop. You also see it with the Office of Federal Contract Compliance. I don't know who deals with federal contracting here, but this is a law that says that if you're going to deal with the federal government and you're going to contract, you can't discriminate. And uh, the OFCCP continues to focus on this thing and to take this gender equity issue and put it into federal contracting as well. So it's not just in the employment context, but it's in your dealings with the federal government. Salary history laws are the next sort of extension of this that we're really seeing, again, another new trend that we haven't seen very, uh, for, for very long now. And what it says is that someone's salary history can affect, again, it can perpetuate how you are going to get paid, if you're a woman, if you're a man, or whatever, based on how you've been historically paid. So salary history laws prevent employers from asking applicants about their salary history. If you can't ask about their salary history, you can't you know, use that as a basis and perpetuates this, the same inequity. So there's no presently no national ban. There's no federal law that prevents a company from inquiring about someone's salary history. But 21 states do. 21 states have stepped up and said, if the federal government's not going to do it, we're going to do it. Interestingly, Michigan and Wisconsin, they go completely the other way. They have banned salary history bans. <laughs> they have a law that says, you cannot pass a law that says you can't ask about salary history. So, thank you for what it's worth. So, uh, here in Pennsylvania, there's no general statewide ban. Um, there is a statewide ban for Pennsylvania state agencies that's been effective for a few years. Some of the local municipalities have stepped in. Pittsburgh has a, 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 a law that says you can't ask about salary history. New Jersey, Philadelphia, effective uh, for a couple of years, that says during the application process, you cannot inquire as to someone's salary. The next step, even further from that now, is to pay transparency laws. And this is saying that employers, in certain circumstances, have to say, this is what the job is going to pay before you even apply. So irrespective of the applicant, be it male, female, person of color, whatever, you know in advance what the salary is going to be or what the compensation level is. It's the idea that employers have to disclose a salary range without asking about someone else's prior salary history. Different ordinances have different timing. Some of it is in the actual job advertisement. It has to say what the salary is. Some of it is during or prior to the first interview. Sometimes you can make a conditional offer. It just depends on the local statute. So it's something that, depending on where your business is located, or more importantly, where your employees are located, uh, might affect the business. Um, you know, again, New York in 2022, New York State and New York City enacted legislation that requires private employers to publish the salary wage in all job postings. So if you're putting something on Indeed, if you're putting something out there and you're going to have an employee in New York, you need to say what the salary is going to be. Pennsylvania, there's pending legislation, but you know there's a lot of pending legislation in Pennsylvania when it comes to employer uh, uh, and employee rights. Specifically, that you know we'll probably never actually do it. 
other states have different transparency laws depending on where your company is located or where you have employees. You might want to take a look at that. No poach agreements. This is something also that's uh, trending in 2022. A no poach agreement is an agreement between two companies that says if we're going to do business together, we'll agree that we won't hire one another's employees. Um, Sometimes it can be no hire, it can be no solicitation, and you see this often. You'll see a company that says, if, if we're going to do business together, I'm going to place my people in your place of business. You can't solicit them. You can't hire them. You're going to get to know them. You're going to understand them. You can't steal them from me. And, and, and this goes on it all the time. This is in many, many uh, types of relationships and contractual and, and non-contractual relationships with business. The problem is, what it does is it affects the employee. The employee is all of a sudden bound by essentially a non-compete, where that employee can't leave and, and pursue yeah. her, her, her uh, occupation in a way that's unhindered. It, it's a, it's a non-compete or a, a, a limitation on their ability to work that they never agreed to. And, and, and courts generally don't like that. The goal is to force employee retention by making comparable work in the same market unavailable. And it's, it's you know, anti-competitive and uh, courts are certainly cracking down on it. Um, the U.S. Department of Justice has begun criminal prosecution of employers with no poach agreements. They do this under the antitrust act, saying that it's an antitrust violation to say, if you're going to work for me, you can't go work for them. Or if you're going to work with us, you can't take our people. Uh, the Department of Justice has announced criminal indictments for this. They're serious about this. Uh, just, just this year, in 2022, the Department of Justice made a statement declaring that competing employers' no approach agreements are inherently illegal. And that there's personal liability. You know, anytime there's personal liability, you know, we as lawyers perk up. It's a bad day when the company gets sued. It's the worst day when, you know, your name is on it as, as an officer or director of the company. In Pennsylvania, there's a BMAC case that came out in 2021. It had to do with a logistics company and a trucking company. They had an agreement, like I described a minute ago, that said, we're going to do business, we're going to provide our people, you can't pay them. It went all the way to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and they held that no higher clauses are unenforceable under Pennsylvania law. You can't have them. And I guarantee that there are thousands and thousands of contracts out there right now that have these types of provisions in them, and they can be illegal, unenforceable under Pennsylvania law. And what the case seemed to say is that it doesn't have to be a formal agreement. You can have a you can have a non-formal agreement, just an understanding that we're not going to do it. They're not going to. You can't hide behind the fact that there's nothing in writing. You can't engage in this practice in Pennsylvania anymore. Criminal history. This is another way that companies, you know, impact an employee's ability or a person's ability to gain employment. Pennsylvania has the Criminal History Records Information Act. And what it basically says is you can't use someone's criminal history in determining whether you're going to make them an offer for a job unless it has to do with the position for which the person has applied. And I didn't use the that's an exception. Um, so if, if you're applying for a job as a bank teller and you have a history of fraud, okay, it's relevant. <laughs> if that person's hiring, you know, looking for it to be a bank teller and they smoke pot in high school, is that relevant? I don't know. Probably not. But the point is you can't just unilaterally utilize people's criminal history against them in the, in the employment pro in the process. There, there's Pennsylvania statute, and it also says that if you do that, if you utilize someone's criminal history as a determinative factor in not hiring the person, you have to tell them. You have to notify them in writing that that decision not to hire them is based in whole or part in the criminal history record information that they found. Now, again, most companies don't do that. Most companies look at it and go, well, we're not hiring them because whatever. They didn't, they didn't interview well. Someone else was more qualified, whatever. But the point is, if you do criminal background checks and you're going to utilize that information, be very, very careful of, of that. And there is a law right on point in Pennsylvania and other states. Um, you can't consider arrests, it's only convictions, misdemeanors and felonies, but it has to be a conviction. And it only applies to applicants, not current employees. So you can look at your criminal 
history of your current employees and you and, and make employment decisions based on it. I don't suggest doing that. And, and don't get cute. What that means is don't hire the person, you know, then say, oh, right, now we can do it. Uh, that, that's not the, the policy of the law. Well, again, yeah, yeah, except in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, um, Philadelphia has a law that says that uh, there's a ban in the box. You can't ask about criminal history at all during the during the you know, application process. You have to give a conditional offer, um, and then you, you can take a look at it. In, in a recent case, Long v. SEPTA, again, very recent, SEPTA agreed to settle a class action that was filed by former job applicants alleging violations of federal state law including they had a blanket ban on job applicants with prior drug convictions. That, you know what, if you have a prior drug conviction, don't even bother. And uh, not necessarily uh, surprising, they had to pay $3.6 million uh, for a policy like that. There was a blanket discrimination against uh, people's uh, prior history of drug use. Um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, I know, I know several of you in here utilize background checks. If you're going to use background checks in the employment uh, decision making process, it requires a notice to applicants if they're rejected because of their background. Credit check, criminal background, academic verifications. And again, this is good policy. Look, if there's a Steve Goldblum out there who was a, a serial fraud person, and every time someone did a background check and saw Steve Goldblum, you know, and I didn't get hired on, on that basis, I should be notified and an opportunity to say, wait a second, that's not me. This is the 18th time I've seen this Steve Goldblum come up again. So the application, or the applicant, pardon me, should be notified or needs to be notified and they have an opportunity to say, wait a second, you got the wrong person, and to, and to come back to say, that wasn't me or it's inaccurate for some other reason. Many of you who use uh, background checks utilize a third party vendor to do so, and, and I usually recommend doing that because there are documents and notices that need to go out, summary of rights, pre adverse notices, post adverse notices. The point here being if you're using background checks at all, be very, very careful. Either utilize a third party vendor or talk to us about it. And then uh, I think this is the last topic, and I'm moving pretty quickly to try and get us back on. Uh, point here. Restrictive covenants in 2022 continue to be a very, very hot issue. Courts don't like post-employment restrictions when it comes to non-competes. There are different types of restrictive covenants. A restrictive covenant is a covenant that restricts you after you leave. It could be a non-compete. You can't go work for another company in the same industry, in the same region. Non-solicitation agreements. You can't solicit, you know, people's clients or employees after you leave, confidentiality agreements, inventions clauses, there's different types of restrictive covenants. The ones that the courts don't like the most, however, are non-competes. And there's a real trend toward getting away from non-competes. I mean, California, you know, they have a statutory ban on non-competes, except in very, very certain circumstances. They've made a decision, a legislative determination that the rights of an employee are greater than that of the company to protect them from uh, potentially unfairly competing, and we're seeing that in other states. Michigan has laws like that, New York State has laws like that, and others. Um, several states have amended laws regarding non-competes, that's what I was just saying. California, Oklahoma, District of Columbia, you know, some of them have almost total bans. There's legislative proposals in Pennsylvania and New Jersey to restrict non-competes. So if you're utilizing non-competes, tread carefully, Talk to us, make sure you're not just using something that was in a employment agreement from 10 years ago that you took from another company. It's something that, that you really need to take a minute and think about and, and, or, or talk to us about. And that was the end of my presentation, moving as quickly as I could to get started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back for a little bit of wrap up on separation and then we'll take our, we'll take our fourth break. Did you think we were done because Steve was done? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we should have told you back and forth, so, yeah, about 10 more minutes. Um, okay, uh, a couple more, couple more quick trends. Um, policies here, in, employees, electronic information, according to this case right here, the Dippin case, employers have a duty to protect employee information. What that means is to have um, encrypted 
computers, passwords, all of those good policies that, that you need to have to protect employee information um, uh, electronically. So, um, gender identification. This is kind of like the next level of your handbooks and your policies of making your policy gender neutral. And by gender neutral, we mean no longer using he or she or him and her or you know the S slash H E or whatever people people have. Um, that's because, as you probably know, many people are using pronouns. Some of the pronouns are not strictly male or female. Some people don't identify themselves as strictly male or female. So when we're looking at handbooks nowadays, we're going through sort of giving it a one complete read. To, to, to take those uh, those references out. You'll find that you don't, grammatically, you don't even really need him or her. Sometimes you can just say employee, you know, or you don't need anything. Um, and obviously, if there are titles, many of these have changed already. We use like the very easy example of chairman to chairperson, you know, that sort of thing. So that's um, that's uh, best, best practices there. Harassment training. Uh, many of you have harassment training in house at your place, and that we strongly recommend that you do, whether you do it yourself or whatever. There's a strong recommendation to have it in person, meaning that a person is standing in front of your employees and presenting rather than online. Again, no matter you know who it is that does it. Pennsylvania and New Jersey do not yet have a law for mandatory training. Several states do, but the recommendation still is to have it so that you can check the box that you had training. Um, and and maybe your employees actually learn something, like don't harass other people. Um, <laughs> uh, harassment training, harassment training for years and years, and many of us have been giving harassment training for a very long time. Um, for years, it has been a certain body of work, you know, it's been sexual harassment mm -hmm. and, and national origin and hostile work environment and some of these other things. Now we've been adding uh, implicit bias, or sometimes it's called indirect or unconscious bias, along with microaggressions, if you've heard that term before. You know, but, so that's, again, the next level of education for your employees. If you're, you know, it used to be that your employees thought, like, you know, we can't, we can't say this, and then you have the training, and now they realize, you know, it's this you can't do or say. And now it's like, you wish it was that. Now it's <laughs> that, now it's that. You know, now it's this that you really that you really can't you really can't say. So microaggressions are things that the comments or actions that send a message of bias. They could be consciously used, but often they're unconsciously used. You don't even know really that you're doing it. They're hurtful to the recipient and they perpetuate a bias. So for example, if you make a comment to a female mechanical engineer. Wow, you really know your subject. Why wouldn't I know my subject? Because I'm a woman? Yeah, that's sort of the implication. So the speaker, the speaker thinks that they are compliment, right? No, I, how am I in trouble? I said you really know your subject. That was a good thing. No, that was a really biased thing. So um, to an Asian American office worker, oh, I heard you speak. You're very articulate. Why would I be articulate? Because um, to a male kindergarten teacher, this is what we're throwing, throwing the bones at the guys. Uh, male kindergarten teacher, I think it's great how you can be so nurturing to the kids. Yeah. By the way, these are all real examples of things that people people have said. Other things are like using male pronouns. Um, I've had to stop myself from doing this. This is something that I catch myself doing, saying you guys, like like you know, you guys all know what I'm talking about. I, don't, I know you're not all guys, but it's just an expression, right? Well, yeah, that's an expression, this is gender based. So find something else, you know, like you, you all, or you folks, or you, yes, you, 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 you. These are really old examples, like, like you know, decades old examples, but they make the point, you know, using terms like Indian giver, or that's so gay, or you throw it a girl, the meaning LGBTQ, this is a real comment. The good thing about what we do is we don't have to make up any stories, right? We just, we just tell you everything that's really happening. Um, we had a client, we had a male supervisor for one of our clients in the week here. 
you tell your stories of others. <laughs> we had a male supervisor that said to a, um, a, a lesbian woman, she was openly gay, and he said to her, I'm not laughing because this is funny, I'm laughing because I can't believe he said it. He said, oh, I know you're gay. I have a neighbor who's a lesbian, maybe you know her. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> He's like, no, I was just trying to, I don't know what you're trying to do, man. <laughs> um, where are you from? If someone, if someone's obviously from another country, they have an accent, you know, where are you from? I wouldn't even know you have a disability. You act so normal. <laughs> I don't see color. People say that. I don't see color. You know, I don't care if you're purple. You don't? Really? You think you're purple. Um, but, again, all examples of microaggressions. And then finally, last topic, separation from employment. We all know that before you terminate someone, you have, to, you have to think about a lot of things, right? Most people in this room are very good and will call us and say, I need to terminate someone, can we talk about it? Great. Sometimes we get the call, I just terminated someone, can we talk about it? Um, the, other thing we, the, other thing we get is, the other thing we get is, hey, quick question. Okay, all right, I know, I know attorneys, I get it, but it's, sometimes it's not a quick question. You know, there are a lot of things to consider here. So there's a little checklist for you just to kind of go through before you terminate someone. Our best advice to avoid a lawsuit, this is great advice. I don't think we've done a seminar in the last 10 years yet, we had this slide. Document things immediately. Discipline, if you're gonna discipline an employee, or certainly if you've made a decision to terminate an employee, Document it immediately. What I mean by that is, things happen between the time you make the decision and the time you actually pull the trigger and maybe terminate someone. I'm gonna tell the story because some of you may have heard it before, but anyway, a few, a few years ago, it was December, it was the middle of December, and we got a call, I got a call from some, some HR people, and they said we, we, we need to terminate this woman, Ellen, I think her name was. She wasn't a terrible person, she just wasn't a great employee. And they said, okay, we're gonna let her go. One of the managers said, Christmas is in two weeks. We're not gonna let her go before Christmas. We're not gonna do that. We'll let her go after she comes back. Okay, I said, document it now that you made the decision, which they did. They went on Christmas break. Ellen comes back from Christmas on January 3rd. She walks into her manager's office and she says, congratulate me, I'm pregnant. Uh, exactly, right? Uh, yeah. uh, she's killing him. Um, so the manager calls and says, Now what? We're going to fire her today or tomorrow. And I said, You can let her go. You documented the fact that you made the decision terminated without knowing she was pregnant. So you're not going to be in trouble for pregnancy discrimination. Now, you might be a member of the human race, like you're not gonna, you know. Um, they actually ended up not terminating her then. They, she, she lasted a few more months and then they had a reduction in force. But the point is, lots of things, as you know, happen in the interim, right? People get sick, they get ill, or they, they kind of sense that something's happening, they make a complaint, you know, they kind of insulate themselves. Can I say one thing? When you're filling out performance appraisals, make sure you're accurate about it. Don't say the person did a good job, and then six months later when you get a fire the person, Based on performance, oh, yeah. they sue and they pull out the evaluation. They, they got to, you know. No, Michael's, 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 Michael's absolutely right. So, you know, when, when, when you get a claim, right, you get a claim, you get that letter from the lawyer, you know, from the people on the other side of the aisle from us who represent the employee. And it says, and the first thing we say to you all is, you all. Um, <laughs> the, first, the first thing we say to you is, let's the personnel file. You know, what, what do you have on them? What do we get? We get evaluations, exceeded expectations. Yeah. You know, yeah. right on, oh, why? Why? If you fire them for performance, why should they exceed an expectation? Um, yeah, so help yourself. Help, help us help you. Um, severance pay. In Pennsylvania, most other states, there is no obligation to pay severance unless you contractually obligated yourself. You could require an employee to sign a release in exchange for severance pay. This is just some typical provisions you might get in a release. I'll let you read that. Um, the big one is, of course, the release that someone, an employee, is saying, we will not sue you for anything in exchange for some type of money. Don't forget, and I'm going to just echo what Steve said a couple of minutes ago, please do not use your friend's company's severance agreement that they emailed to you, you know, 
that looks like it was typed on an IBM Selectric. Uh, <laughs> True story, we had someone give us a handbook that was mimeographed. It was purple, okay? <laughs> it was too old to have that nice smell, but, but it was purple. The separation agreements change. So if someone's 40 or older, there are different requirements about how much notice you have to give them. You have to give them 21 days to review it. They get seven days to revoke it. And again, you can spend 10 minutes just on this. If you're, if you're terminating more than one person, they get 45 days to review the agreement. So it really matters. You just can't take the separation agreement, change the name, and then, and then hand it to them. So you, the point is, it's in bold and italicized. You can't use it. Just don't change the name today. Um, and then finally, I think this is the last one. You may not know this. Typical protocol is when someone leaves and they call the company that used to work for you, you give them, you know, name, rank, and serial number, right? Uh, yeah, we can verify employment for Shirley. She worked here and she worked in our data entry department uh, up until, uh, until August. That's fine. You can do that. Many companies still do. But you don't have to. If you wanted to say, no, Shirley stole from us, and that's why we fired her, you don't have to worry about a defamation suit or something like that, because there's, there's a specific statute in Pennsylvania that says you don't have to worry about a defamation suit. That if you give true and accurate information about a former employee, then you're all set. That, was, that statute was passed because of terrible circumstances. Actually, there were men who were child molesting. And they would they would be caught or suspected, and they would just go down the street and get another job. And the second place would call the first place and say, "Why was he fired?" And they were scared to say anything. So they said, uh, "We don't verify. We don't give positive or negative information." It's crazy, right? So now you're protected. Okay. So we're, we're running a little bit over. So perhaps for some quick questions, and we'll give the first quick. Yes, sir. Yeah, in the context of independent contractors, any cases dealing with the of council relationships with law firms? Any, any cases dealing with of council relationships? No, if you're of council to a law firm, right? An employee of an independent contractor, any cases dealing with that issue? I have to say, I don't think, I don't think we've seen any of those, those yeah. cases, not, right? Of, of council, like of, of that. I mean, law, law firms have, have been pretty notorious for calling people what they want, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for. Uh, uh, employees for independent contractors, but um, but but, this, but put it this way: there's no exception, you know, for attorneys. And I, I suspect that if a law firm had uh, 20 workers, you know, 20 attorneys, and 18 of them were independent contractors, and two of them were actually employees, there would be there would there would be an issue. So so, but no, I don't think I've seen that. But there's but there's no exception for attorneys when it comes to that. Okay. Um, oh yeah. Microphone is needed. Are you seeing companies who originally had vaccination policies move away from those vaccination policies, and are there any legal ramifications in doing so if employees have to move those policies? Yes. Question is, are we seeing companies that have vaccination policies that are moving away from vaccination policies and legal ramifications? The answer to the first part is absolutely. We're seeing companies that had vaccination policies. And they are relaxing them or moving away from them. Yes, we are. We are seeing people, companies generally. Um, and the answer, the second part is no. If someone was terminated, let's say, because of a vaccination policy, and now the company no longer has it, then the fact that they no longer have it, it might be a factor in the litigation. Like, hey, you don't even have it anymore. But I think everyone understands that. You know, then was then. Um, and, and, and now is now. So I haven't seen that be a legal factor. Uh, employees are suing some companies. Again, we have you know three or four or five cases in the office now. Um, but uh, they're, they're just now getting through with all this, you know, the EEOC and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, one more, and we'll take a break. Yes, Bob. Is there a danger factor? You, you talked earlier about here. People where we know where we've had industrial accidents where people have been killed with their hair being closed here. Yeah. So mm -hmm. is there some danger to call this that potentially Right on cue, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so when you're talking about a relationship to like the, the crowd. Could you not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 
all of these, all of these laws, right? And we're talking about discrimination. So you talk about clothing, what people can wear, and culturally, can you wear something on your head? Can you cover your face? You know, can you wear a certain garb? They all have exceptions for safety. So if there's a if there's a bona fide safety threat, then that's an exception to almost almost everything. You know, you're never you're never expected to put the employees or the other employees at risk. You know, that doesn't the safety would would would, would, would trump the, the, the cultural aspect of that. So yes, if, if somebody was wearing their hair in a certain way and there was a there was a real safety threat around machines, that you would be able to to uh, to direct them in that way. So um, we're gonna take a ten minute. My name is Frank Spada, and uh, Julie and I are going to be doing the next section, as you can see, what you need to know about marijuana in the workplace. I wanted to retire, I was sort of my work, but my plane got in about 2 o'clock this night, not because I sampled the subject <laughs> during the break. Uh, so we're going to try to go through it. This is a pretty long section as well, so we'll try to walk. You have everything in there. Excuse me. Her contract will be under the law. Marijuana is still illegal. But it's still Schedule One drug, um, meaning that it's has no current accepted medical use. You have to tell that to the states and that medical marijuana effect, and a high potential for abuse, which is really the definition for a Schedule One controlled substance under federal law. You have to assume at some point in time uh, that it'll change and it'll be taken off that. That states are moving along and become more recreational, certainly. Uh, it's medicinal, and it's been proven, uh, yes, it's proven that it helps a lot of people to provide a variety of medical problems. Uh, under state law, well, it depends. In some states, it still remains illegal. In other states, uh, it's only for medicinal use. And then there's others where, as you know, for instance, New Jersey, where uh, medicinal and recreational use works. A few states, uh, Use is not allowed, but certain CBD and low CFC products are permitted to be sold and used. There's sort of a picture of uh, what it looks like states that allow recreational, states that allow marijuana use, uh, those are just medicinal. Okay. Uh, some basic marijuana facts was in your system. Uh, THC, psychoactive ingredient marijuana, probably know. It can be ingested by a variety of ways, smoking, various edibles, uh, resin like hashish oil. Uh, the effects include <laughs> feelings of euphoria, increased heart rate, blood pressure, slurred speech, red eyes, cognitive impairment, unsteady gait, in some cases paranoia and anxiety. Uh, what's the rights of the workplace? Uh, of course there's medical, medical use and recreation. Security, what's allowed, what's not allowed. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, what's the law in Pennsylvania? Uh, the MMA. It's legal for medicinal use only. You have to register for the program. I uh, have a approved physician certified to have a medical condition that qualifies for the prescription. Uh, this is actually pretty darn easy. I uh, think you go into these uh, dispensaries. Uh, they set you up uh, virtually with someone, uh, and you can get a marijuana going. It's not really that difficult. I paid a medical ID, I have proof uh, that you can use medical marijuana. The card expires, by the way, so you have to be certified every year and pay the state, I think it's $100, uh, to in order to be recertified by the department every year. Um, the prescription is by vaping it or ingesting it in some matter, smoking it, strangely, in Pennsylvania. That it's not legal. Um, what's the law of New Jersey? Well, there's the, uh, the law. We, we shortened that. Prima. Uh, it's legal for medicinal and recreational use. Again, you have to register for the program. Crew physician certify you, uh, depending on what condition qualifies you for having a medical marijuana card. Um, now, this card expires every two years in New Jersey, so you don't have to re up every year. Uh, take the prescription way you choose, any way they choose. You can smoke it in New Jersey, they don't have any specific rules on how you ingest it. Uh, what's prohibited in the workplace? PA. 
there's a statement from uh, a statute. So you can't discriminate, in essence, in any of the conditions of employment uh, solely based on the fact that the person uh, has a medical marijuana card as part of the register. <laughs> What's prohibited? And Julie did a lot of this on Facebook. <laughs> All these fancy things they just said. Uh, now, what about in New Jersey? <clears throat> Similarly, to the same. You can't refuse to hire or take any adverse action on any of the uh, uh, terms and conditions of employment because the person uh, either does or does not uh, smoke, take aerosolized or otherwise use cannabis uh, items. What else is prohibited? Well, the ADA, the PHRA, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, and the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination also prohibit employers from discriminating against an employee based on a disability or a perceived disability. So you have to be careful because the condition that qualifies someone to have a medical marijuana card is also a condition that's most likely protected under one of those or all of those statutes. Um, and retaliating against an employee receiving a compensation for his disability, as you all know, uh, can also be uh, discriminatory and subject to uh, prosecution. Uh, are employers required to accommodate marijuana in the workplace? The answer is no. Neither in, yeah, neither in New Jersey nor in New, uh, Pennsylvania are you required to accommodate the use or the pre presence, possession, sale of marijuana or impairment in the workplace. We'll talk a little bit about impairment a little bit later. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Whether or not an employee has a medical marijuana card does not change this fact. So the fact that somebody has a medical marijuana card doesn't give them a license to be able to uh, smoke in the workplace or be under the influence in the workplace or somehow impaired. Uh, you don't have to accommodate that as an employer. There it is. There's the card again. Are employees allowed to permit marijuana use in the workplace? Actually, I think you are under the statute. You're allowed to accommodate if you want to, both in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. Uh, I don't know why you would want to do that, but uh, there's nothing that prohibits you from either statute. Uh, but I would think most employers would have policy that are not going allow that prohibited use of the workplace. It would be smart to do that. Um, yeah, we, we strongly recommend that you work. Um, the MMA in Pennsylvania prohibits medical marijuana use from certain safety sensitive jobs. Uh, so there is something in the statute that says if you have if you are doing or applying for one of these particular jobs be control of government control of chemicals, high volume of electricity or any public utility, performing heights or into five spaces, performing any other tasks with employee being life threatening or somehow affects the safety of the person or somebody else uh, in the workplace, uh, or performing duties without the public health or safety risk. There you go. In New Jersey, uh, Green has no statutory requirements or regulations which formally prohibit uh, safety sensitive jobs. Uh, so that's a little unusual. So it's up to the employer to make sure uh, that they take measures to prevent somebody, mechanic or whatever other safety sensitive job you might have uh, working uh, on a machine if you're on a line or a manufacturing facility, for instance. Uh, so you're going to have to uh, make sure uh, that these individuals or not working there or do something uh, in order to make sure that the person, uh, if he's going to work a safe and sensitive job, uh, isn't impaired. Again, that's a difficult thing to go find. Uh, impairment or uh, under the influence is not something that uh, is easily, uh, actually, it's impossible. And I'll get into it now with the testing solution. Okay? You want to do a flip? Yeah. All right, here's the flip. All right, so why should we care about marijuana in the workplace? Why does it matter, right? Um, as Frank was just saying, 
the law doesn't prohibit you from letting people who have a medical marijuana card, for example, in Pennsylvania, from um, using it in the workplace if you choose to let them do so, except in certain safety and sensitive positions. And in New Jersey, they can even use recreational marijuana in the workplace. Well, you don't want to have them using such items in your workplace. You don't want them to be impaired at work. In New Jersey, you don't want them to be doing that in a safety sensitive position. The statute doesn't even cover that. So if you don't have a policy in place with a carve out for how you handle medical marijuana, you could have disability issues, you could have safety sensitive issues. There's all kinds of issues that could come up. So this really applies to everyone in this room that you gotta have it set up right so that you have the structure in place to do what you need to do to keep your workplace safe and keep people productive too, right? So, all right, medical marijuana rights in the workplace testing. What if you think someone might be using marijuana in your workplace or is impaired at work? How do you find out if they don't have it red-handed in their hand? Don't catch them with it, right? Uh, what do you do? And, well, I, uh, we're going to get into that, right? So, can employers test employees for marijuana use in Pennsylvania? Under Pennsylvania's MMA, yes, they can test if the employee to see if they were under the influence of marijuana or any other substance that can cause impairment like alcohol or cocaine or paint fumes, prescription drugs, doesn't matter. You, you can, if it's testable, you're allowed to test for it and test it. So um, you can test them whether or not it's somebody who doesn't have a medical marijuana card or somebody who does. You can test anybody who's an employee of yours for this. But you do have to follow certain guidelines. So under Pennsylvania law, uh, can the employer conduct random testing? Yes. Reasonable suspicion testing, like they're acting funny, could they be high? Yes. Post accident testing, they're not acting funny, but they suddenly got in an accident for a goofy reason, could they have been high? Yes. What about pre hire testing? We're going to start with Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia, the general rule is it's fairly new. Uh, it is, you cannot make pre-employment testing a condition of employment. So that means in Philadelphia, you can ask someone, would you please test for this while you're in the hiring process? But if they say, no, I don't want to, you have to continue the process anyway without telling them to do so. Okay. Yes, that's what I've been recommending to my clients. Exactly. You can test them after they're um, hired. Uh, I don't want to go into the, uh, the details here of the other aspects of pre-hire testing. It has to do with exceptions, like if you're a police officer, they can pre-hire test you, you're going to work with kids, but it's in your hand notes, okay? Um, same thing, other exceptions, uh, you can do it when there's a state, a federal contract that requires you to pre-hire test. Again, check your hand out if you're in Philadelphia and you need to pre-hire test to see when it's allowed. And when it's not allowed. Uh, but as Frank mentioned, once you become your employee on the first day of work, now it's not a free hire. And then now you can test them. Okay? All right. Yes, everywhere in the Commonwealth except Philly, you can test at any time, including free hire. Okay? So, and you can't make it a condition of employment, but they have to get tested. What about New Jersey? I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but I keep looking. We will drop this presentation flip from Pennsylvania to New Jersey, Pennsylvania to New Jersey, and sometimes it'll be both states. And you'll see it by the moniker up in the corner. All right, so that you can tell what state we're working on. Okay, how about can they uh, test in New Jersey for uh, marijuana? Yes, employers can conduct pre employment testing for marijuana in New Jersey and random testing. Reasonable suspicion <coughs> testing and post accident testing. Now, I put it in that order because I said to myself, I want everyone to see that you can do the same thing in both states, except Philadelphia, okay, as far as testing. But it gets really wonky after that, and we can get into that later, uh, what happens after you get tested. So it's 
is nifty that you can test them, but what can you do with the results? That's the problem. Sisters, sure. We can We can both do it together. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's over 100 metabolite success for THC. Uh, the urine testing is probably because it's cheapest. I mean, you can do, we'll get into hair and blood and saliva, but the cheapest one is urine. And most people do urine testing. Um, the thing is, you're not testing for THC, and that's why you can't determine whether somebody's impaired or not. They can only do it. What you test for is these metabolites, which essentially is. THC, after it breaks down in the body, it ultimately, you have these metabolites and you get, you, uh, actually, they'll fall into the, out of the bloodstream, they'll fall into the urine, uh, you can usually uh, either for urinating, uh, sweating, no such thing. That's how you can get rid of this. So, um, it, it's really, it's impossible to determine whether or not somebody's impaired because you don't test for the THC and there is no standard uh, like there is for alcohol where it's 0.08 everywhere or less depending on where you're at to make it stricter, but you're intoxicated legally as a result of that. There is no standard agreed to uh, for test urine testing uh, like there is that federal standard for alcohol. Um, THC is fatty soluble. I won't go into this too much, but that's why you can have positive or negative tests from one day or the other, because metabolites and THC are actually stay in your body before they fall into your bloodstream. So, uh, depending on your physical characteristics, depending on your exercise regimen, depending on what you eat, uh, all those things affect your, your lifestyle. Will affect how uh, whether or not you can store these things in your Fatty cells for a long time. For a long time, correct. Yeah, it can be, uh, and that could be up to 30, 60 days. It can be positive, depending if it's a urine test. Mm -hmm. Urine, blood, saliva, hair. I mentioned uh, certain factors can affect detection, uh, dosage, the route of exposure, whether you smoke, mm -hmm. whether it was an edible, um, frequency of use. You use it every day. You use it once a week. You use it once a month. Uh, duration of use and uh, the person, your personal. Um, the negative squeeze is usually done when you do a urine test. You probably all know this is a test. Uh, if a positive result occurs from a negative screen, then it's confirmed by this gas chromatography mass spectrometry test, which essentially is like there's fingerprints of all drugs and it matches up the particular fingerprint of what they is in the specimen with that, and you can determine and confirm. It's pretty, pretty 99.9% effective. <coughs> The tablets can be detected in order a few hours after use. One time, we can use it to maybe have traces for five days, days, but then, as I mentioned, they're chronic users for up to 30 days or more. Because again, uh, it can be fatty soluble, it can be in your fatty tissue, um, so it could, depending on your characteristics, could be involved. Um, a blood testing can uh, detect the tablets one time use it for one hour to uh, two days. We could use it maybe seven days. Saliva one hour of use, and then maybe one to two days. And hair testing uh, is probably the longest. It can detect about seven days of use. And in frequent users, it can detect up to 90 days or several years after use if you're a chronic user. Um, current technology, testing for marijuana. I think this is wrong. Go here. So, what's the problem? There's tests. We can do tests. What's the problem? Right? Can a test tell us if someone is currently under the influence of marijuana? Nope. <laughs> Current tests cannot definitively tell us when the person was under the influence of marijuana. As Frank said, in some cases it could be 30 days, 90 days a year. That person still impaired? No, they're not. But their the test results said that it's in their system. Does that mean they were impaired at work? No. So you can test, but it's really challenging to say what can this test do for you? And what do you and so some places are like not testing, right? Because they say, I can't use the test results or I don't know, it's inconclusive. So what can I do with that? 
and then you know maybe it's a good indicia along with other indicia, which we'll get into other things that you can uh, keep in mind, other behavioral characteristics that might suggest that you're high. Uh, but what if you're a federal contractor and they require you to do the test? Now, now you have to test whether you think it's effective or useful or not. So, uh, discipline and use of test results. This is really where the rubber hits the road for everyone in this room. You have someone who maybe has a medical marijuana card and they tell you about it, fine, now what do you do? You maybe don't have anyone who told you anything about a medical marijuana card, but they're acting weird at work and extra giggly or munchy or uh, they're driving the forklift into the wall and you're, something's wrong, you don't know what's wrong. Uh, there's many situations where somebody tells you that somebody in the workplace, they saw them out back smoking something and they thought it was marijuana. Or maybe they come into your office. I have a couple of clients who've had this happen to them and they come to me and they say, this person smells like pot. What do I do? First thing you want to do is find out if they have medical marijuana. Right? Um, but then again, if you're in Pennsylvania and they smell like they've been smoking, is that the in Pennsylvania to smoke your medical marijuana? Anyway, you get the idea. So what can employers do with these test results? Can they impose discipline? Can they terminate employment? These are the kinds of questions we get on uh, clients. Yes, Pennsylvania and New Jersey employers can discipline and can terminate if employees use, possess, bring, store, distribute, sell, or are the influence of marijuana at work, but only if the employer follows the law and certain guidelines. So uh, what do you need to do as an employer before you impose discipline or before you terminate their employment in Pennsylvania and New Jersey? Way different in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Completely different universities. Step one, the employer should have a written policy against drug use, possession, sale, etc. in the workplace. As Frank mentioned early on, if you don't have the policy, technically you could allow most of your employees in most situations in Pennsylvania if they're medical marijuana users to use it in the workplace or in New Jersey, medical marijuana or recreational. You could allow them to use it in the workplace. So you need to have a policy that says no. We do not allow that in the workplace because that's, that's legal in both states. You can have that policy. Now a lot of you may have some old policies about you know, drug-free workplace, and that's great. You have a medical marijuana card out. If you need one, you have to address that issue, especially because it's, it's, it could be a disability, the underlying cause of them needing to use the medical marijuana. If you need that karma to, to deal with what you do in that situation. So that's, that's why you have a written policy. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, you can prohibit marijuana use in the workplace, but you don't have to prohibit it except for certain safety sensitive jobs only in Pennsylvania. Um, so if the employer doesn't express and prohibit it, then the use by them in the workplace is okay. And you might find yourself with some problems. I, I don't know about you, I don't want to be the employer who throws in place a policy after they've already been confronted with someone with a medical marijuana card. I mean, yes, you would do that, but doesn't it look better if you already had the policy in place? Because if you do it when they tell you, could they at least make the argument that you know you're doing that because I told you I have a card? You just don't like me because I have a card. That's why you're putting this in place now. I I get the argument if I was on the other side. All right, more requirements before imposing discipline. Step two: follow your state's law for the proof level needed before you can discipline or terminate. Is anybody here in New Jersey? You are okay. All right, oh, and, and you are, okay. Well, good luck. <laughs> I won't say it's impossible. It's a long road. Call us before you discipline or terminate in New Jersey, but you'll see that. Okay. Anyway, the requirements in Pennsylvania before you discipline. There is no specific criteria in Pennsylvania for what you have to do before you can discipline or terminate based on marijuana use or impairment or selling or storage in the workplace. Except that you can't discipline or terminate just because someone has a medical marijuana card or a medical condition needing marijuana, right? Okay, so 
it's not, it can't be just stats. Okay. Yeah, it can't be based solely on stats. Other than that, you're okay. So, in Pennsylvania, if somebody has a positive drug, drug test result for marijuana, and you have substantial other evidence, for example, if they've admitted it, or there were witnesses to them smoking it or using it in the workplace, or the product was found on their person in addition to the test result, um, or they exhibit signs of being high, there's an odor, odor of marijuana, uh, or they have slurred speech and red eyes, or they're unkept or simply talkative. So you've got some other indicia other than just the test result, which again could be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days ago they took the marijuana, they are not in care. Okay. Um, then you can discipline them for violating your policy. And your policy was not in the workplace and not in care in the workplace, right? All right. Um, so, in Jersey, as I said, good luck. It's, it's really challenging. There are very strict proof requirements uh, before you can take any action against them. In New Jersey, under CRIMA, the results of a drug test are not enough. Literally, you cannot terminate, you cannot discipline just because they had a positive test result. It's against that statute. You're giving them a right to sue you. Don't do it. Under CREMA, a physical evaluation must also be done to determine impairment. The reason why is because you can't tell when they took the drug, right? Unless they admit it. Right? Okay. So, in pencil in New Jersey, you're going to need a physical evaluation by someone who has gone through the certification process that New Jersey is going to implement but hasn't yet. <laughs> yeah, it's part of the good luck part, right? Because they've got this policy, this this uh, statute that says we will have um, a certification program with the name Wire Workplace Impairment Recognition Certification. And once people are certified to do that, they can be the one who decides if the person had slurred speech and red eyes and had them on cheese or whatever else that made them feel that the person was probably high at the time. But until it happens, what do you do? Right? So uh, fortunately, they have just came out in uh, September, it just came out, that until they have a certification process in place, which they don't get, they've created a document It's at the end of your a folder there that you can use as an employer without the need to use the certified person and it sort of covers the same sort of material. Uh, it's a reasonable suspicion observation report and I would like everyone, even if you're a Pennsylvania employer, to take a look at that because that's not technically what applies to your state. I think it's a pretty good tool. It's got, it's it really is quite useful. And look, look at what it says, the, 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 the items that are on that list could help you to if somebody is in here. And it'd be good documentation for if you do take an adverse employment action, you can offer termination or any other lesser discipline. Yeah. It's a good document to have to support that, even if you're present. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. It, it sort of says, I, I was thoughtful about this, I documented it well. Yeah. So, and the staff member should be sufficiently trained to determine impairment, um, even though they don't have to be certified. Now, there's a lot more for New Jersey, um, but all these items that have to be done in the, the handout, and, uh, making sure they're properly trained, but I'm just going to leave this for you folks to read. We gave you a lot more information, it's sort of chock full here, it's, it's a tool for you to use, but it's probably more than we can get into today. But again, this is that form that, that gives you those shovel appearance, frequent sniffling, odor of marijuana, Lots of good stuff here. And the regulatory commission says if you already, if the employer already has a similar form that they're using, that they're not required to use the form, they can use a similar form as long as it's, it is similar and it has various things that you can say, okay, it's a reasonable suspicion, this is why, and all the various things that you might uh, see or determine that the employee has had the privilege Yeah, but just like how many of you have to? Uh, comply with the FMLA. Anybody here? All right, people that have comply with the FMLA, most people use that designation notice. Yeah. Be 
because we know that the court is accepted. We know that New Jersey, until they come out with that certification program, is going to accept this. Which is why yeah. I, I and it's a pretty good form. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, okay. So, let's say you've got past all that, right? You're in Pennsylvania or you're in New Jersey and you've already got a test result that was positive for marijuana. You have no idea when they took it. They didn't give you that information. The employee didn't fess up one way or the other. Um, and uh, you've got other indicia that you found in Pennsylvania or in New Jersey. You use the form by uh, somebody who's kind of shown how to use it or trained in it. And so you say to yourself, all right, I have the proof I need. I can move forward. What do I do now? Step three, ask if they have a medical marijuana card. Why would you want to do that? That's what we always taught our clients. Don't ask them if they have medical conditions. Now you're giving them a protected category. We don't want to know, right? Why would you want to do it here? Well, because if they do have a valid card in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, then they may have protected rights under Pennsylvania's marijuana law, New Jersey's marijuana law, and the ADA, which is the federal disability law, right? And the state law equivalent of PHRA in Pennsylvania, the New Jersey LAD in New Jersey. In which case, you need to handle their situation, their positive test result for marijuana, plus the other condition you had differently than you do anyone else who you got the same sort of impairment results from, right? Because these people have these disability rights. So, and, and the rights under the statute just, you know, from having the status of being mental medical marijuana are older. So, for these people, you need to move slowly and carefully to make sure you engage in the interactive process, which you do for any need for a reasonable accommodation for somebody with a disability or a religious accommodation, clearly we never talked about a disability situation. Um, to the extent you can't, without having to violate the policy you put in place, saying no drugs in the workplace. Okay? So, what if they say, yeah, I've got a medical marijuana card. What do you do with that person? Well, have them provide a copy of their card to HR. So you can put it in their employee medical file which you keep separately from their personnel file, right? Um, and then you want to sit down with that person like you would with anybody else who needs a reasonable accommodation so that you can discuss their situation, their possible violation of your policy because they seem to have been in your hip group, um, and their health needs. Um, yeah, <laughs> so to do it without compromising your substance abuse policy, Try to involve the managers or supervisors if they are needed to help you brainstorm what kind of accommodation would work, right? Uh, you might need to involve your medical provider, I think you should, so that you can discuss what accommodations may be needed and how long after they use their prescription for marijuana, they should not be in danger. Maybe even medical provider is going to say, you know, I can't tell you how long you can stay in their system and keep them impaired, but I know for sure that this one thing you can what's an outside figure? Well, I know for sure they took it more than 24 hours ago, they're not still hot. Okay, let's make that the rule then. You know, as long as you're not high, you haven't used it within 24 hours of coming to work, we're okay. The prescription may tell you that you know, they use it to sleep or something like that, but they may not have used it 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah, and it, that, that's an excellent point. It may be on the prescription, and then if, if it's if it's been that they're supposed to take it at night before they go to bed, and then they're coming up with these positive test results at work, I might want to have the medical provider chime in and say, you know, if they use it as prescribed, which is before they go to bed, they're not going to be high at work. In which case, you're like, good, because what if you don't have that extra piece with the medical provider, and then that person gets an accident? Do you want to be in the position where, I don't know, maybe 30 people who are visiting the premises got hurt by the accident? You want the documentation that a medical provider said, I want anyway, said that, the, that it's okay, that they weren't high at work. Okay, uh, I would also recommend that for that person, after you 
dealt with this, they have the card, right? Um, you should really only discipline the person who has the card if they knew about your policy, because you're allowed to have them use it at work if you don't have the policy, right? Um, if they understood what was required of them under that policy, and they violated that policy, that's the part where you took the test and had the other condition yes, et cetera. You might want to consider for the person with the medical marijuana card a lesser form of discipline, or maybe even just a note of the incident in their file, which you don't recommend to use the term discipline in the first one, just so that you can avoid, you don't have to do this, but I recommend it, just because you don't want to claim a retaliation. You're doing this because of status as a medical marijuana card user. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm just documenting it for the file. We can't have this happen. You have a conversation with your medical provider. We're all on the same page now. You promise me you won't use it more than you know the night before you come to work. We're good. Just don't have a problem, right? Uh, what if they say uh, uh, give them an additional copy of their substance abuse policy as well? I would, and have them sign another acknowledgement page. Is that what you're saying? Just a reminder: you really do know about my policy, and you have to comply with it. But what if they don't have? A so they, if they're not a medical marijuana user, they might be in Pennsylvania. Okay, they're in Pennsylvania, because that's where we are right now, or they're in New Jersey. Uh, what do you do with that person? There's, they have no disability need to um, be using marijuana. I would still have them sit down with HR to discuss their situation and their possible violation of your policy. In Pennsylvania, if they have a positive drug test, but no other evidence of um, that they were high at work, and they insist they're innocent. I was not high at work, I swear. Uh, I haven't used marijuana. Um, you have the right to discipline them because they violated your policy, and you could terminate them if you chose to. But if they claim they're innocent and it's possible the test result is coming up with information that's months or years old, right? Because they could they put them in that lesson system. And this was their very first incident. You can still discipline them in Pennsylvania. Uh, absolutely. You might choose to give them a lesser form of discipline. You might choose to terminate them. It's entirely up to you. But again, keep in mind that the test is not giving you perfect results. So um, just make sure whatever you do, you have it be uh, even the way you handle it with people across the board. So, um, what if they say, no, I don't have a card, and they admitted it? Or there were witnesses product was found on them and have written policies. So you really got them dead to rights, right? Uh, go ahead and discipline them as you see fit. Just have it be neutral the way you would handle it with anyone else, including if you terminate them. That's fine. Um, what about in New Jersey? Now we're in a difficult place. Do you want to work on this one? <laughs> you want me to do it? Sure, go ahead. All right. New Jersey. Uh, it's tough, actually. It is. Um, let's say they only have a positive drug, drug test result in New Jersey, no other evidence, and they insist they're innocent. You cannot terminate them, you cannot discipline them, unless you go through a whole bunch of other hoops. You must follow the majority of the rules for physical observations to substantiate the lack of the influence of marijuana. We talked about, like now you can use those guidelines in that report in your handout, right? Um, but once the wire certification program is in place, you're going to have to use a certified person. Uh, what if you have know, a positive drug test result? You've gone through all the hoops of crema, right? If you maybe use the report because the, the wire certification isn't out yet, maybe the wire certification is out, maybe the certification from a person. So if you can jump through all the hoops, you say, okay, now I can terminate them, right? Now I can discipline them. And you've got the written policy. You still need to do more things. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. You have this, there's this three day period for them to try and uh, prove their innocence. It's, there's a lot. <laughs> so, just if you're in New Jersey and you have somebody you think may be you know, impaired at work, found marijuana, please contact me. <laughs> and we can all jump through the hoops together. <laughs> Question. What are some determinations as to the safety steps of I ask because, for example, I know the grocery store. So employees may be using the forklift. They may also just be using the 
blood and cow. Most of them, you know, have stipulations like, oh, shut up, that person has to go to the plane. Very good, so is that it? Um, that, well, to me, that would fit. What state are you in? Uh, okay. Okay, in Philadelphia. Uh, so I just want to look at these specific criteria because I know that it's going to fit. Those would definitely fit in uh, the other reasons, the sort of catch-all category for safety. But I just want to. It does say safety sensitive, and there are certain things. I don't, it doesn't necessarily say forklifts or anything like that. But I think if OSHA determines that it's a safety sensitive position that has to be trained, you have to have certification or specific training for it, I think you're probably pretty safe to say, uh, you know, we can, this is a safety sensitive position and we're not going to allow you uh, to perform that position. Yeah, it's public safety thing. I even thought I'd have a client that's an engineering company. What if you have a structural engineer who's hot? You want them designing your bridge? No. So, you know, think creatively about what might be safety. It doesn't, it can't be, at, or what if they're watching small children? Definitely a safety issue. So if you go one step further, mm -hmm. um, we use a lot of labs. Mm -hmm. Recently, we had everyone under the lab or safety. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that safety something? Well, it's based on whether you're uh, a potential harm to yourself or others. I guess, you know, how often do you use labs? Is it once a week? use the ladders consistently every day you're stuck in inventory and things like that. You might say, yeah, it's like using a ladder outside if you're a worker or, uh, you know, or uh, you know, putting a roof in or putting windows in where you're, you're on a ladder. Um, yeah, but if there's going to be a fine line here. You can keep giving me examples and I can keep saying, yeah, you're it's not a fine line. But you have to be able to defend it. Uh, I think if you have some certification situations where they're required and there's training involved, you have a better chance of argument that it's a safety sensitive rather than you just designated it as a safety sensitive because you want to be able to say, no, you can't do that and smoke right. marijuana. Well, I had a case where I flipped the fork and died, and there was a big lawsuit. One of the issues was whether you're the host. So, yeah. Yeah. Very dangerous. So, you know, I, I'm not sure the ladder's going to fit, but it's at the edge. Certainly, if they yeah. were the one um, slicing the meat at the meat counter. You know, I'm serious. That's 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 a serious machine. That's a serious problem. We even designate comments as being Well, I think that's appropriate. And actually, I like that idea. If you're sort of designating what you consider to be safe and sensitive situations. Mm -hmm. Yes. How does all of this apply to having a no smoking policy and other use of other tobacco products? Are you in Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, it's not legal to smoke a pot anyway. So, um, smoke anything. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that, I know in New Jersey there's a, there's a law relative to lifestyle that you can't discriminate against someone for a lifestyle situation, like smoking cigarettes or something like that. Um, so, but, but, but anyway. I don't think that has any, this has anything to do with that. Yeah. So, um, you can have a no smoking policy in Pennsylvania. In New Jersey, I think you, you should have a new you can have a new smoking policy, policy, but you can't say I'm not hiring you because you uh, smoke, smoke exactly. cigarettes. That's that's exactly what right. you can't yeah. you can't take the action against them or not hire them because they do something off the job that you don't particularly like, <laughs> like smoke cigarettes, for instance, which isn't even yeah. Every everyone I've yeah. ever seen yeah. so far, anyway, they, they have the, the drug policy mm -hmm. as one thing, right? And a no smoking policy tends to be something like a separate policy. Mm -hmm. Because they're not, they're not necessarily related. You're not going to get high at work typically from something like a cigarette. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. I have the work, the workman's comp implications, and also if somebody hurting somebody down screaming in the manufacturing center. Because that's what we have. Somebody getting hurt. That's the result. The problem. A lot of times, there was one case uh, recently about workman's mm -hmm. comp and whether or not, for example, uh, the the company can pay for uh, the marijuana as a result. Uh, and I, I think the court ruled uh, that it, under the workers' comp statute that somebody with a medical marijuana card would be covered relative to that. And that's in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure about New Jersey. I don't think I haven't seen a case in New Jersey regarding that yet. I'm talking about the implications of an accident occurring in close to but see, that's that's what I was getting at. If somebody has an accident at work, right? Sure, if somebody else gets hurt at work and, and they need workers' comp, 
they, they would be covered because it wasn't, I mean, it happened in the workplace, they're covered, right? Um, and, but what happens if it's a third party, a, a customer gets injured? What if it's downstream from the manufacturer? Yeah, you're liable for all those things, which is another reason why you need the policy and you need to have this uh, put in place where you, know, you don't allow drugs in the workplace, even if somebody has a medical marijuana in um, I have seen people get, and you have to decide if you want to have it be literally a zero tolerance policy, I believe that that's required if you're a federal contractor. It has to be a drug-free workplace, completely drug-free. Uh, any of you, are, anybody here a federal contractor? Yeah, there are exceptions, that's exceptions yeah. to both of the statutes. Yeah, but... Um, if, you're, if your federal contract requires you to test, to take action as a result of the test, then you're allowed then, to do that. You're, 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 it's going to be an exception to both yeah. of those. But, but basically, if you have the policies in place properly and you're following them, you can eventually, you know, keep someone away from the safety sensitive moments or positions, I suppose. But you'd have to work it probably with your lawyer to figure out how to do that because you don't want to reasonably accommodate them out of the job unless you have to. That, that could be discrimination in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, time for the next break, and then we'll move into the general. As I said, really, really good stuff. Uh, the overtime pay is for all hours work, so that typically does not include leave, typically does not include time that's not spent working, holiday pay, um, but there are exceptions. You can make policies pretty much do whatever you want as long as you meet the floor of the law. So if you say to an employee, oh yeah, like we'll consider all of your leave time work, I'm like, why do you do that? I don't think anybody should do that. Do that. So, so we have some examples that have that policy. Like the PTO accounts, lunch accounts, and you do that. But I think I think it's it's one of those things you want to make sure as with the commission policies that your policies are clear as to what you're not going to work in. So uh, one, one example of recent developments in the, the overtime pace here, and uh, I thought it was worth bringing up, not a main, mainly applicable to everybody in this room, but tip employees is, is just showing kind of a changing of the tide to keep with that, that metaphor of if you have a manager or supervisor and you're in a business where employees are tipped, and that manager or supervisor typically gets tips, that's going to change that. They are only entitled to pool in the tips that are received from the services now if they do all of the work that is generating that tip. So they, they roll the silverware, they put it down, they mix the drink themselves, bring it, and it doesn't happen. So tip employees now um, are it, it's, it's this, this change of tide to try and get these service industry employees more of a, a livable wage. This is a way of doing it to avoid something that they would typically get um, from going elsewhere. So the tips that they get. And of course, you need to make sure you meet the minimum wage threshold of tip employees of seven dollars and twenty-five cents. Uh, if you don't, you need to make up, make that up, and have the policy in order to make sure that they meet and get everything they're entitled to. Um, there's also the eighty twenty rule where a tipped employee to be able to be paid less than the 725, at least 80 percent of their work needs to be uh, directly related to that tip generating uh, activity. All right, uh, as Michael said earlier, there's there's a particularity that was proposed. So we experienced this actually in the Department of Labor investigation, and it was they, they wouldn't hear any argument in response. It was yeah, they paid bonuses. Non discretionary, you didn't calculate it into the overtime. So every time somebody was paid a bonus in a week that they worked overtime, that's it. We're going to pay that. They say the liquidated damages. And by the way, your documentation wasn't that great. So we're going to make sure that uh, we deem that willful because it looks like we're trying to hide it. But it got, it got into this, this very messy uh, position, and that's the problem with wage and hour laws. Very, very yes/no oriented. Either you meet the law or you don't meet the law. 
So in discretionary bonuses, it's the employer maintains the discretion up to a time and almost immediately prior to payment of whether to, whether to pay the bonus or not. Uh, what we have seen is an employer will say, you know what, everybody's been working so hard for all this all this great work, we'll, we'll pay them and they let, it, they'll let the employees know a week before payroll, like, hey, you guys have all been working really hard, there's going to be bonuses coming in. That, that little gap in time prior to the payment being made will make, will make the Department of Labor and potentially the courts underneath the FLSA say, no, no that's not discretionary. You promised it to them. You said to work in hard, continue to work hard. The implication was keep working and we're going to pay you. Uh, non discretionary bonuses are, it's kind of like an Achilles heel of being a nice guy. The wage and hour laws. Being a nice woman, and of course, automatically going against what Mike said earlier. <laughs> but uh, the wage and hour laws don't care what your intentions are for the large. They're bad intentions, they care. Oh, they care. But if you're trying to be a nice person, if you say, you know what, uh, Joe Schmo deserves more pay, and I use Joe Schmo since it's my name, of course, but he deserves more pay, and I, I want to give him more pay, even though. Like our agreement was that you'll get paid if you don't do everything the right way after that money is paid. Um, so you need to be careful. You need to make sure your written policies reflect how you're paying people. You want to try and stick within them. If you there are are exemptions, but you want to stick within what the written policies are. Um, and by exemptions, I mean there are exemptions for when things have to be included in the regular rate. So. Gifts, certain holiday gifts, that can be exempted. You can pay somebody a little a, a little gift, maybe give them some food around the holidays, that's all right. There's certain, uh, we talked about the leave and leave pay, that's typically exempted unless you guys had to decide, uh, look, we're not going to pay for our work that is leave. Um, but overall, in the FLSA world, if you're paying somebody something, Want to make sure all the calculations are done right. You can't look to the payroll companies. You can't go to ADP or go to another payroll company and say, "Well, we told you how many hours they work and what we were paying them. Why didn't you magically do the calculations for us?" Because they aren't going to apply the payments unless you tell them the right way to do it. And the Department of Labor doesn't want to hear, "Well, their software was confusing, or we didn't read the booklet that they gave." There, the assumption is the employer knows or should know, and the employer is doing it the right way. Um, and then finally, a, a very more, it's always been around, but a more recent uh, type of bonus pay, hazard, or as I, I like to say, a hazardous pay, came up over COVID. To get people into the office, to get people out and working, you're getting bonuses, and that includes bonuses for time work. So the, the, the hazard bonuses, the Department of Labor has started to find or tried to find that that is non-discretionary, that you said, hey, we're going to pay you more to be in a certain place and do more things. This is a, it's a little more argumentative with the discretionary versus non-discretionary bonus, because you can try and couch it in the right terms. But if you let an employee know ahead of time that a payment's coming, you're taking that argument away. So you want to you want to make sure one you have the policies, two the discretionary versus non-discretionary is clearly identified in those policies, and three just don't promise them, hey, be a nice guy to do it after. Nice person, nice nice person. Oh, along, following up on the bonuses, um, the story has a client who going by private equity, different client than the one I told you about a few minutes ago, and the yeah. board of directors awarded. I'm, I'm trying to pick my words carefully. Put something in writing to the president, CEO, and the COO saying you earned a bonus. And that is discretionary. You earned a bonus of fifty thousand dollars. <coughs> it will be paid when the other executives get their bonuses. That was three years ago. It still hasn't been paid. And they fired but all those executives. So the new executives have contacted me several times saying these three men, these three men, I'm saying, when are we getting your bonuses? We haven't been paid. the other executives haven't been paid ours. And I said you're going to get sued at some point, and you're going to lose, because it says earned, and you can't delay it for years and years and years. And next time, call a lawyer, whether it's me or someone else, to discuss the wording before you say you earned the bonus. So as Joe said, just be careful with the wording and what you're promising. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Uh, the next statute, we're coming down the home, home stretch. That's, I think there's a couple of them. The next statute, the PA minimum wage act, is the Pennsylvania statute that governs minimum wage and overtime. Um, both as of now, the federal minimum wage and the Pennsylvania minimum wage are the same, seven and a quarter. That could change at some point in time. Um, it also addresses exemptions for overtime eligibility, and as I mentioned earlier, the highly compensated exemption and the computer exemption are not recognized in Pennsylvania. Um, depending on where your business is and where the employees live, you may want to check, you should check those states and municipalities to make sure that you that minimum wage. Um, <coughs> Pennsylvania minimum, minimum wage act both differ in certain respects from the FLSA. And again, uh, it can provide additional benefits over and above what the Fair Labor Standards Act provides. And you have to give the benefit to the employee, whatever provides more benefits, that's what the employee is on. Um, there we cover this. All right, here's some issues that come up frequently. Um, companies not paying the minimum wage. This can happen several different ways. Either you just said paying you five dollars an hour or seven dollars an hour, something less than seven and a quarter, or you don't pay the employee for all the time worked, so the regular rate effectively is under the minimum wage and not get you to uh, Changing time records, and this is actually happening. A uh, client calls and says, "Yeah, we have an employee complaining that she wasn't paid for all her hours worked." Uh, and I said, send over the time records, and when I looked and dug into everything, the employee was right. She worked 40 hours, she was paid for 36 hours, or 35 hours. I talked to the CEO of the company, we investigated internally, and he said, yeah, the manager wasn't happy with the employee's work, so we cut her, we cut her out, trying to pay better. And I said, you can't do that. And we got the manager on the phone, and the manager said, well, she was working, but she didn't do a good job, she wasn't productive, so I didn't pay her. And I said, you can't do that. So the lesson is don't cut hours. You can discipline someone if they're filling too many hours or tracking too many hours. You can have a policy that says you're not allowed to work overtime unless you get prior approval. But if an employee works overtime without prior approval, you have to pay the person the overtime. You can fire him or her. You can discipline the person, but you have to pay. Um, not paying overtime. Uh, a lot of companies either mischaracterize and misclassify as exempt versus non exempt, so they're not paying overtime, where they just don't pay the overtime. They'll say the person with 50 hours and they're paying 50 hours straight time. And sometimes they get away with it, sometimes they don't. And when they don't, there's a class action or collective action. You have a group of employees that sue together, and it's not the center of there. That quickly adds up to a lot of money. Um, I don't want a lot of time in my business. Can you tell them about the difference between a paid period and a work week for purposes of? Sure. Sure. A work week. Every company should set a work week, and it should say in your handbook the work week is Sunday at midnight to Monday, you know, seven full days, and that's the work week, and that's what you count for the hours work. How many hours in that work week did the employee work? And if it's over forty, and the employee is not even the employee gets time and a half for anything over forty. The pay period can be different because that sometimes is a lag. Of a week. Um, the pay period is irrelevant to overtime. It's the work that they have to focus on. To go, to go back into uh, the employee versus the contractor, uh, you look at the side statement in the FLSA world, if you have an employee that says, nah, I, that's fine, I'll work over 40 hours, I just want this agreement, that, that's not going to hold water, you're not going to use that as a potential. They said, I can violate the law. That doesn't work. And don't trust the employee to say that you steal track. They could, if they did not snitch, they could hold it deep inside, and you can't control what else happens in their life. We had an issue where there, we had a client that had an agreement with an employee that wasn't really above water, and the employee was subject to a subpoena that went to his employer for all time work as uh, part of a divorce with his wife. So, the advice to the employer at that point was you can't lie to the court. You need to tell the court. We're not people who are <laughs> Right. I mean, it made things a lot easier, but so it, it opened up. It, um, we worded it correctly and avoided Pandora's box from opening up, but it was a learning lesson to say I don't care how much you trust an employee that you're working with. 
you can agree to violate the rules. Yeah, or, but, or, or if it's 30, I worked 30 hours this week, but I was supposed to work 40. That's all right, I'll leave it up next week. Next week I'll work 50. And then I'll leave it out, right? It doesn't work that way. Because it's the work week. Um, working off the clock, following up on what Joey just said, uh, we've had clients who call and say we discovered that a handful of employees in one particular department can't do all the work during the work days. The manager is just loading them up with work. So they're going home and doing the work because they're worried they're going to get fired because they're not keeping up with the work and they're not tracking that time. What do we do? Uh, I said, well, now that you know, you have to do an audit and pay them. So they had the people in the handbook, it was a self report going back two years and write down how much you can work at home <coughs> or at the office that you didn't clock in. And they then audited it to see if it was reasonable and they were um, So they paid time and a half on it. And the employees said, they all said that the manager told them, do what you have to do, but only work 40 hours a week. And that's a problem. So, I mean, you shouldn't give the managers instructions to tell employees that. Michael, would you ask for a release from the We got a release when we did that, yes. And we didn't call the Department of Labor or Court. But we did get a release for all back leave. And we, we had them sign a verification that they self reported it based on their hours that they said they worked, for which they weren't paid. Um, not counting preliminary and personal merit work, there's a computer that logging on the computer. We have some clients who the employees have to sanitize, you know, wash up before they go into a factory. That's all compensable time. Employees should be paid for that. Interestingly enough, the court, the Ninth Circuit on that case that came up this morning, said logging off your computer while it turned off was not compensable <laughs> because they didn't have to, because they were leaving. They didn't have to wait for it to come on before they were able to work. Um, travel time, we're not going to get into detail, but that's a bear. It's easy to get in trouble with travel time. So if you employees who travel, you should call one of us and then walk you through that. Are they in an Uber? Are they driving? Are they working while on the plane? Are they going to the conference? Are they right. the conference here? Is it during normal working hours or night? Right. Um, not having email, text, cell phone time. This is a long line of working off the clock. Employees go home at night. They're checking their email. They're responding to email. Should they get paid for that? Technically, yes. If they're not into that, they should. There is something called the minimus that if you check an email and it takes you, you know, 15 seconds, that's the minimus you don't have to pay the person. But a lot of the minimus time adds up to compensable time. Um, on call time is another issue we didn't talk about. Is the person on call able to go out and do what he or she wants, or do they have to sit at home by computer or sit at home 10 minutes from the employer's place of business? Those are factors that have to come to play. And again, if your employees are well called, we should talk to them more, kind of walk them through that they should pay while they're sitting on call doing nothing, or only if they're called with extra good work. Clocking in and out, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But in essence, employees, if you're on the time clock or writing the time, should record the time accurately. They should clock in the beginning of shift and clock out when they leave. Time clock around. There's usually a time clock in here. How many people? Not many. Mm-hmm. All right, here's a story. It's a true story. You're allowed to round an employee's time to 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So if an employee clocks in, their shift starts at 4 p.m., they clock in at 4 or 3, you can round it back to 4. So let's say we're rounding for 15 minutes. If they clock in at 4 or 8, or anything past 4 or 7, so 4 or 8 to 4 or 14, you round it up to 4 or 15. So if you can't always go in, Employer's favor. So you can't always say, all right, they clock in one minute late or 15 minutes late, we're going to out and not pay them for the first 15 minutes. It has to always equal out, theoretically. And if you round improperly, you're going to get sued for a class action or a class of action. And again, you're going to have all the employees who clock in and out be part of it. And the rounding affects all of them equally. And you're going to have a problem. So make sure your, your clock. Round it, set the round properly, and make sure they're getting paid for the time. Right. If they clock in, shift starts at 4 o'clock, the employee clocks in at 3.40, and goes and sits in the cafeteria, you don't have to pay the person. So if they're not working, you don't get paid. The problem is how do you prove they're not working? Are there cameras? Are there, um, is there a, something that they have to <coughs> to get an actual place to work? Pass the time clock? 
Camila vai falar para a gente. This is probably the driest of the drive when you watch. I was about to say how exciting this is. But, so, documenting what you do and why you pay what you pay is by far the most important thing in my mind for this slide right now. Um, documenting why you're paying what you're paying, what is paid by day, what the hours are worked by day, what is paid per week, what hours are worked per week, and tell you the amount of times we have somebody that says, we have an employee saying we pay rate, right. here are records from the payroll company that shows the bi-weekly pay and hours. And the bi-weekly pay and hours is not per work week, it's per two weeks, and it doesn't help dispute what is going wrong. And if you violate the documentation requirements, of the FLSA, you're also flipping the burden. And now you as the employer have to prove, no, 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 we paid them right, and yeah, we don't have the documentation, but here's here's how we did it. And that you're starting you're starting behind the eight ball. And we keep records for at least three years, because as we discussed, if there's a willful finding of a violation, they'll try and charge you going back three years from the employee's uh, last pay. Um, Maintain the records in your own business or in a close by facility that you can get within a day so that you can have the records. Don't rely on the payroll company unless you're working with the collaborator. It can be a great resource if you use correctly, but you can't just say, here you go, here's whatever, and I'll, I'll reach out to you if you have an issue. Um, and if you're, if, if you're, depending on your documentation purposes, if you're paying by check, when the document, when checks are paid and when, and it's one of those things where it, it, it's easy to say, and it's, it's paperwork, and it's not, it's just boring. Nobody really likes to do it, but it saves you if you're doing everything the right way. So if you're listening to every, all of our recommendations that are coming up, the main one is when you're doing everything right, make sure you prove it, make sure you have the documentation for each employee, what they're paid, when, why, what your policies were. There, there's an audit, and your records are and we've seen that. We've seen that the, 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 the employer had the right, the right state of mind, wanted to pay their employees, did mathematical calculations wrong, documented everything based on those wrong calculations. They didn't work with the payroll company correctly, used the software incorrectly, and it just was a snowball. It got bigger and bigger. And the Department of Labor said, you know what, your documents. Tell one story here, tell them another, we're going to go with the documents and say you're over time and know a lot of them. So, uh, and then one quick example to kind of go with the theme of, look, we need to do the right thing, we want to do the right thing, nobody's trying. Most people aren't trying to slate employees and keep them from getting everything that they're owed. Everybody in this room obviously is not trying to slate employees, but even nonprofits can be subject to the FLSA and run afoul of it. They volunteers doing work that may be compensable and they're not paying them. And it's just, it can be one of these things where you, know, you got to know what you're doing and know what the laws are. And that's where we can help you to kind of stay in line with the requirements. <coughs> Some recommendations and I guess you go. Um, somebody in your company should review payroll documents to identify employees that are taking under the 684 week. That are automatically not exempt that are being treated as exempt. That's an easy one. Let's go into an audit. If something's mischaracterized, again, the issue is going to be how do you treat them going back the best three years? Do you pay them back over time or do you just say we're the work directors are switching it out? Um, review job duties for compliance with the exemptions. And again, the job description is not dispositive, so it may say one thing and the employee actually does something. So look at the actual duties to see if anyone is characterized. And it's not a fun exercise. And I've done it for many companies. It's, it's kind of boring and it's tedious and there's a lot of gray areas. But, and it's tough, but it's something that's important to do. Training or they speak with managers about the Fair Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act and Pennsylvania and then Pennsylvania and then wage act requirements for exemption versus non-exemption. So you may have someone who should be exempt, but the managers making employees manual labor a lot of the time, and they shouldn't be doing that, and that, that's a problem. 
or we're not in systematic control, throwing out this person to kind of labor, we're paying that person out of the um, And review policies so that they're, they're compliant and communicated to employees. Policies on overtime, whether you have to get approval, how you report it, you work in the how you report it, things of that nature. And there's more. So, um, you want to make sure the stigma documentation, you review your policies and pay records to make sure everything is documented in accordance with the policies and one of the policies. So, just to make sure that how you're paying your employees is, is clearly spelled out. So, the ambiguity is, is what uh, the downfall is. Um, you want to make sure that your policies, if you have traveling employees, and, and they're non exempt, they're paid for every hour they should be. That you have a policy that may be a little bit more beneficial just to avoid uh, going against uh, what the travel time requirements. If they're on call or if there's other compensable requirements that they need to receive pay for, that it's documented and that they're paid accordingly. Um, as I said in a couple slides ago, you got to document the hours they work. You need to know when they're working, and you got to be careful of the biggest uh, faux pas of. Yeah, they work eight to five, Monday through Friday, 52 weeks a year, and for the last 20 years. They never come in earlier than eight o'clock, never left later than five. That's a big red flag. So make sure you document the hours that they're actually working, um, especially if they're working overtime. And you want to make sure the employees know when changes are made and when policies are going into effect, changing or ending. Any questions? Instead of an individual. Okay. There are certain tests that have that as one of the check the box factors. 
and hopefully that LLC is doing work with other entities as well, and not just your company. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? No. Nobody? Thank you for coming to us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the effort. Uh, it's, it's a massive great weather. Don't forget to get back on the way out.